Hi, I'm Sarah Dysack, and I'm the founder of FTM Essentials. Well, we're in Chicago now, and I grew up in the suburbs, and I've been here pretty much my whole life. Um, so I moved from Evanston to Chicago when I um, moved out at 18, and I've been in Chicago ever since. Um, I went to the School of Air Institute for undergraduate work, and then I worked there for a couple of years and started grad school there in the fiber department. And um, I was in the fiber department in my second year. I was doing it really slowly because I was also working full time when I quit to start my businesses. No, no, I, um, there was about a year um, from when I quit grad school and working at the Art Institute to opening the store. I was, um, I didn't have any idea of what I was doing, so I thought it would happen a lot faster. But during that year, I waitressed and worked for a lawyer, and um, I had worked in food service a lot in my life, so kind of my other path, I think, would have been food service. I went to pastry school briefly. Um, but then I had no, I mean, I had no experience working in this type of retail or in this industry at all, um, but it was a passion, and so that's where I ended up, and I don't really know, you know, how, I'm still surprised myself that it worked out as well as it did because I didn't really have any background in it. So I kind of went from office work to this with a little bit of dabbling in between. A cisgendered female. She, her. Um, I identify as queer. I find myself using a lesbian a lot the older I get, which I think is sort of just a old lady thing, which is funny. But yeah, so queer, lesbian. I'm 44. Well, um, it was really kind of a natural progression. So I had opened Early to Bed, which was feminist is a feminist sex toy store in Chicago in 2001. And it was the first store in Chicago that was owned by women, a woman. Um, it was the first store that I think really started from the ground up with a mission of education and community involvement and um, kind of a different way of doing business. Uh, I was also, it was just me, so I was able to be really responsive to what people needed and wanted. There wasn't a corporation behind me. It was, I was making all the decisions on my own. So one of the, so then the first customers I had were people from my queer community. And a lot of those folks were trans guys. And you know, right away, they started asking for trans supportive gear, packers specifically. Um, <coughs> Excuse me, packers, which are limp penises that are meant to make a bulge in the pants, not something that you would use for penetration. So kind of different than a sex toy, but because they're penises, they come from the sex toy industry because non-sex toy people aren't making a lot of penises. Um, and so I started um, just kind of as a response to my community, carrying what was available at the time and really seeking out whatever I could. Um, you know, 2001 in some ways is a really long time ago and not that long ago. But when it comes to this stuff, it's, it was a hugely different situation. There was one person who was making, or one company that was making, for the most part, limp backers that you could buy. Um, so there wasn't that much to, ha to, to get. But as I went and I worked hard to find more and more gear for this community, um, and as our website grew and as our web presence and the internet, you know, things started to be a thing. Um, we were finding that we were getting younger and younger folks ordering from us and we were having some issues with parents and I was feeling a little bit nervous about younger people accessing our website even though there's really nothing that we can do to control that. Um, and having to navigate through butt plugs and dildos and vibrators in order to find the gender expression gear that they wanted. Um, so I started, I just had this kind of like moment, I mean, where I was just like, I just need to have a separate site for this stuff so that um, I can feel confident that if a parent comes at me, that they're pissed off that their kid bought a $12 limp penis and I'm doing something wrong, which is always sort of how they would approach it, um, their child's not doing anything wrong by ordering from us, but whatever. Um, I could feel really confident saying, you know, they're buying this off a website that is, it's not a sex website, it's not, you know. Um, and so that's kind of how FTM Essential started, as I was just, you know, because you can create websites so easily. Um, so I just kind of put together a website on my own and had very few SKUs on it, you know, but it's grown a lot. And I think that 
this industry of trans supportive gear, specifically trans masculine supportive gear, either has been in the realm of the sex toy store, which is fine and great and there's a lot of crossover, but also kind of, again, leaves younger folks in a sort of precarious position. Um, and parents, like, they're really pissed if their kid buys something from a sex toy store. Even if, this, if they're buying the same thing from a not sex toy store, it seems a lot more, a lot less scary to them. Um, but, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, I also wanted an opportunity for um, people who work with trans individuals to be able to navigate the site with them. So again, so caseworkers or therapists to be able to, to help folks find this gear without, again, having to kind of wade through all the adult stuff. So early to bed started in 2001. Um, we started carrying trans gear from the beginning, but FTM Essentials, I didn't start FTM Essentials until 2012. Yes. And it was, it, I, I think it left me open to some degree to, to some possible problems. You know, like I, I really, all the laws about any of this stuff is completely murky. Like, totally murky. I feel very confident that none of it would seriously get me in trouble, but I would go to the Supreme Court to, like, fight for a 14-year-old's right to have a limp penis. I would not fight necessarily for a 14 year old to have a butt plug. Let's just, I mean, it's, I think it's, there's two different things. And I felt like separating them out was really important for a lot of people in, in the customers too. Like, I think that the folks looking for trans gear were either not, you know, they're not immediately going to think to go to a sex toy store or they're just not going to be comfortable doing that. And, oh, this is what I was going to say. And because the history of this type of gear has been so much in sex toy stores. There have been other sites that have popped up, but they've been, my experience with a lot of them has been that they're people who, you know, they want to serve their community, they want to have this stuff, but they don't have the experience and the um, background of being in business that I already had under my belt of working with these companies, of working, running a website, shipping, all these things. And so, I was really excited to be able to offer people um, these products with also my 10 plus years in business and our infrastructure of shipping things quickly and like doing the things that I think people had, people who are buying these products from other stores were struggling a lot more with. Like we would get, especially like you know, a couple of years ago, we would get so many customers who came at us from step one being frustrated with us because they had bad experience somewhere else. Someone took their money and never sent their thing because people were because a lot of people were making things in their house or they just didn't know what they were doing. They were overselling so much that they couldn't ever fulfill these orders and they already had people's money and it was go you know like so I think it took a it's we, we would get people who really just had been kind of screwed over by the fact that so many people selling this stuff were struggling to do it in a way that was working. I don't want to be judgmental because I don't think any of it was ill-intentioned I think it was just that it just it's hard it's harder than you think to run a business so um, I think that's also why F team essentials has worked so well with so little effort put into it um, as far as promotion and advertising and all those things I never get around to doing <laughs> um, but yeah it has become um, a huge part of our business um, in a but a relatively short time. Yeah, it, was, it felt very organic. Like, all this stuff, all that trans stuff that we have, this is a reaction, a response to what people want and what's available, obviously. But it's really interesting to see this industry or this segment of this industry, because a lot of this still does still cross over into the sex toy industry, grow so quickly and grow... Um, so like like every year there's like so much more stuff um which has been great but it's been it is not what i set out to do i set out to have a cute little vibrator store and i still do but i also have this huge part of our store that is trans supportive gear and i have a you know two actually i have a, a website too for children that's called trans kids that i started just about two years ago for like under 13 year olds so it has even smaller of everything um, but I'm really happy where I ended up because I also have a lot of passion for this, even if it's not me specifically that's the target audience.
Yeah, I mean, trans kids came about um, a lot in response to we were we bent, we were bending for a couple of years at um, the Philadelphia Trans Health Conference, which is an annual conference in Philadelphia, obviously. Um, and we were having a lot of parents who were looking for stuff for their like five and six year olds, and we everything that we have is not appropriate for a five or six year old or eight or ten year old even like these are just not appropriate um human <laughs> physiology does not match up to them um and it was also as a parent of a gender non-conforming slash trans child um i also understood that, that kind of there's a lot of parents who who cause those kids are that age who are looking for more than just um the, the gear so we have books and we have book reviews and you know stuff like that so a lot of the stuff that's really specified for little kids um and i really wanted to kind of make a clear distinction between emerging adults and kids um because there's a huge difference just size wise but also what their needs are um and i wanted trans kids to be a place where parents because i don't i know six-year-olds can freaking shop online but yeah um my seven-year-old bought herself something on eBay unintentionally. But um, I wanted a place where it was really about the parents and making them feel safe and supported and that this stuff was there for their kids if they needed it and stuff like that. So it, trans kids is like this baby. Well, literally. But like this tiny little thing compared to everything else I do. But it's sort of my heart is really in it as somebody who I think can um, help parents navigate that from a vendor perspective as also from a parent perspective so um well ftm essentials choosing that as a name just it seemed very benign it seemed very uh descriptive i wanted something that was really easy to find when you were googling um i actually regret the name at this point our language around trans identities is evolving at such a rapid pace that actually ftm using ftm in a, for a lot of people is um really antiquated term already even though it's only been a few years since people were even using that term and so i wish that i had thought a little more creatively and maybe made it something that was a little bit more gender neutral um and i am thinking that at some point I'm going to probably have to rebrand it um, just because I think that it's it, get, it already sounds old fashioned uh, but again but it, that, but it also it there's no mincing words what it's about I mean early to bed the sex toy store creates mass confusion with people thinking we sell beds or bedding or something like that so I was really like let's just get to brass tacks here and call it what it is and then trans kids seemed like hopefully a longer term appropriate <laughs> um, uh, way to talk about things. I know there's some controversy about using kids to talk about youth, but I'm really talking about little ones. And so I also wanted that to be really obvious that it was for a younger set. Right. And, and who knows in five years, I mean, I can't predict what the language is going to be. And it's my job, especially as somebody who is not a trans person to be responsive to those changes and to not at all try and like you know put my own stamp on them or fight them or whatever like that so i'm sort of figuring out what the step is to and then it's, it's also a business and so how do i change the name to be more culturally appropriate without losing what i already have so i keep putting that on the bottom of my to-do list for next week sure. <laughs> um so i think of myself often as having three separate little businesses although they're all they all go to the same bank account. Like it's all basically the same thing. It's me doing everything and my staff, um, everyone who works here has their fingers in all parts of it. Early to bed where I sell sex toys is very traditional in the sense that I buy things from vendors who I don't know and I sell things. I mean, I know some of them, but for the most part there's that. Um, with FTM essentials, it's a, it's the same thing. I don't make anything. Um, I mean, one time I used to knit a bunch of dildo cozies, but I was bored. Um, but I don't, we don't manufacture anything. We've contemplated that, but it's a, just an entire different, it's a entire different thing that I just am not in the position to attack. But because, um, because there's been so many holes, so to speak, in the transmasculine world of expression gear and there's a bunch of really small manufacturers that we work with we've been able to 
um, help influence where designs are going and where things are coming from. And because these are small people who are manufacturing things, I'm able to say to them, like, a lot of people are asking for this. Can you do anything about this? So, um, for example, we work with this company um, called uh, New York Toy Collective that makes beautiful packers and they're silicone and they're, um, they make uncut ones and cut ones, which was kind of a revolutionary difference. And we were really on them to make smaller ones because we were selling these, which are, <laughs> these are, you know, healthy adults, people. So these are pretty big to begin with and that this is, you know, a size for a smaller person or a younger person and so you know they were very responsive um and then we were like we need even smaller ones can you make even smaller ones and so they actually shrunk down their molds to more sizes for ones that are appropriate for like six-year-olds and even four-year-olds um so that is in the sense that we're not making anything but i feel like we um sell enough of stuff <laughs> that we can actually help um kind of influence what people are making sometimes. Um, we have somebody who makes stand p devices that, um, you know, they design everything, but they will often send us prototypes to get feedback and stuff like that. Um, I will tell them what I'm looking for. Um, they still, I mean, everyone is doing what they want to do, but um, I think that they are really open to know what this uh, population is looking for and there's not a lot of ways to really gather that information but we get to hear about it every single day what is lacking what people want so um we're always happy to share that information and help people to make things we uh we've contemplated making binders and we've looked into it and our friends at near toy collective helped us because they know more about manufacturing and um they were looking into it and just we it's just it's too much it's too much of a different thing and it's frustrating to me because I feel like binders in particular, um, there's such this great need for them and there are so few people making them and there's really only like two companies that are making them on a, on a mass market kind of way. A lot of people are making them um, sort of in a custom way, which is great. But we really wanted to be able to offer another option for the mass market and of the two people who make them in the US one of them does not have the capacity or that's what they tell us but won't do wholesale so we can't offer them and the other one is great but they're not there's just there's got to be they're not the per, they're not perfect no no binders perfect there's nothing you can do to make binding perfect um, but we wanted to have that other option and I just if I was a different person or I had more something in my life I would that would be my only thing I'd really want to make I have no interest in you know sex toys are taken care of they're great but I think there's a need there that's not being filled and I just don't know how to fill it I am definitely the founder and owner and um, you know head of the corporation for tax purposes of all three businesses and all three businesses <clears throat> they they're very intertwined i have contemplated <clears throat> excuse me um trying to separate them out more there are times just when the capacity of the staff here or the actual physical space of the store seems like it's <clears throat> struggling and i think oh my god what if i could have a store that was just for gender expression gear it was for all ages because there are we do get people who are underage who want to come in and try a binder on um and again such a gray area but uh, we usually, especially if their parents are with them, we let them come in and try it at Binder on. But wouldn't it be great if there was a store where, you know, everyone could come in and, and we could have more offerings and we could, you know, I would like to expand our offerings for trans mask to trans feminine people. Um, but just, we just don't have the space for certain things and it's a different pipeline of things. And, um, but yes, so for right now and probably the near foreseeable future, um, it's all kind of one thing and I run it all and I have a staff of about nine people who do most of the actual work, um, the packing and the shipping and all that stuff. So the helping customers. It's great. Okay. It's great. So you can expose, from what I understand it, I am not a lawyer. I hired a lawyer before I opened the store. She never really found any real definitive stuff. Um, you need to, you cannot expose people under 18 to obscene material, pornography. Um, we do have DVDs in the back. It's, you kind of have to go to them. There are very few of them. Um, I think that is the only thing in the store that I could not make the argument 
that it's a novelty item or it's a gender expression item. A lot of the stuff that they sell at sex toy stores now they sell at like, you know, Target and Spencer's Gifts. So I don't think that, I don't actually know the rules, but it's definitely sort of culturally what we do across the board is have stores be, you know, 18 and up for sex toys that we make that rule. Um, people have to be 18 to come in here to shop just because I don't want to get in trouble, you know? Um, but I don't necessarily know. There's just, there's just not really clear laws on it. Um, especially because this is an unregulated industry. So every single thing that is not a prophylactic or a pornographic movie or whatever, um, is a novelty item. So there's no real oversight of what that is. So. So we're sitting in front of, I'm sitting in front of most of the things that we sell, the things that we sell on Neptune Essentials, which range, I mean, packing gear, packers are sort of the, I would say the bread and butter of this website, this industry, um, trans masculine gender expressive gear, um, something to put in one's pants. We have both what I consider artisan made ones that are handmade and silicone and gorgeous, and we have mass market ones. It's really interesting to see that for years and years and years, the only people who are making these things were basically people out of their homes, small businesses. And then in the past, maybe two or three years, huge sex toy companies like Cal Exotics and Doc Johnson have started making their own versions of things, sometimes ripping off small makers, but um, it's the nature of the beast, which is great because then that means that this stuff is being stocked at probably creepy sex toy stores on the side of the road or, you know, small town mom and pop sex toy stores because it's coming through the same channel. So I think it's great. The product quality is not the same as the product quality that we get. So, but it also opens up, um, economic options for people. So I really appreciate that. Um, we sell a lot of things to hold your packer in. Um, we have underwear that is made specifically with pouches in it to hold a packer. Um, we sell straps that hold a packer. We have um, what's really popular now are these pouches that you just attach to the inside of your pants so that you can wear your packer in a secure pouch in any pair of pants you have. Um, so, and then we sell binders, which, you know, basically flatten someone's chest. Um, and we sell four styles of them. We could probably, if we had the ability to <laughs> sell every style they make and every color and every size, it's a huge amount of what we sell. And I'm perfectly honest, it's completely financially ridiculous for us to do it. We make no money off of the binders that we sell for the most part. Um, and we give away a lot of binders. <laughs> so, but there's nowhere else in Chicago specifically where you can go and try on a binder. And it's a huge thing as far as trying to get a fit. We sell a lot online, but there's a lot more competition online. That's fine. Um, but I think it's really important every time I'm like, oh, there's so many styles, there's so many sizes. And then, you know, we're not making any money off of them and everything. But when someone has the ability to come in and try four on before they make a decision, I think it makes it really, it's really important, you know, especially because they're, they're not cheap and people don't have, you know, we're not talking about 50 year old cisgender heterosexual white men who tend to have a lot more money in our culture. We're talking about a totally different population. And so making things affordable and making things accessible is super important to me. Um, we have a couple things. We have crossed a little bit of a line in FTM essentials into uh, actual sexual expression, sex gear. Actually, it's not even an expression, it's just sex gear. Um, so you will find on the site there are three, I think, masturbation sleeves, um, which, you know, felt a little weird about crossing that line FTM Essentials, but since we get, that's where so many of our trans customers come in, I felt important to have there. You have to be 18 to buy them. Again, I'm not sure about that, but, um, but people have finally, after years and years, started making uh, small sleeves that trans guys can use to masturbate. So not that there aren't lots of things that trans guys use to masturbate, but having products specifically designed for trans guys is very affirming and also just works better in a lot of circumstances. So, um, so that's kind of, and then we have one lube that we sell that is interesting 
that it's specifically for trans guys. Um, Buck Angel, who is a well-known uh, trans masculine porn star, um, c- has worked with a couple different companies to have his own line of toys and lube. Excuse me. Um, and Buck's lube, um, he really designed it for people who are on testosterone so that um, when they, because they, cause it can dry everything out and be make any kind of touch or anything more uncomfortable. So anyway, so it's a very safe, there's nothing really specific about it that makes it a trans lube, except for that it's really marketed towards that um, population, which for some people makes a big difference to have that permission. So I think that's pretty much what is over here, what we sell on this site. And then we sell some, you know, buttons and celebrate trans lives t-shirts, um, which we sell sort of as a fundraiser for our free binder program, which we run, where we have over, we have over 14,000 young people who have applied to get a free binder from us, which is devastating to me because we cannot give out <laughs> nearly that many. I would have to sell my, liquidate my business to do that. Um, so there's just this reminder on a monthly basis when I go and I download the 2,000 new entries or whatever that there's this huge um, group of people who are really desperate for gear that helps them feel more embodied in who they are, which helps me to keep doing what I'm doing so that we can help them. 14,000. I think so. Last time I checked, yeah. I think it might be up to like 16 or 17 now. I know. And between you and me, like, I'm like, these are also potential customers, maybe like, (laughs) you know, two years down the road. So I have this hope that like, because, you know, it's, it's a very interesting, the market for this stuff is growing so quickly. The, um, the number of people who identify in a way that leads them to want to have this kind of stuff is growing so quickly. Um in a way that's kind of unprecedented to know, is this going to continue? Um, is, yeah, is this bubble going to burst? I don't know. But then I look and I see how many people are so desperate for um, this kind of stuff and who don't have access to it financially. Um, it's, I mean, it's not good for my business, but it's very indicative of there being a growing, if anything, market for this kind of gear. Well, we're moving, I think, so quickly, too, towards, um, you know, towards things being more and more non-binary. And so, whereas maybe, you know, five or ten years ago, the stuff that I was selling was really, I was really only selling it to very, you know, confidently trans guy, men, you know, people, um, men, people, men. Um, We are seeing now more of our clients being people who don't necessarily identify on the gender binary anywhere um or who use them who use these these products not necessarily on a daily basis you know so i think it's interesting to see that um everything is just getting more and more um fluid which i think is great you know it's 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 it really is happening so fast but um i definitely think it's yeah it's happening pretty quickly so this is a standard packer um again just basically to fill um, a space in someone's pants um different sizes different colors which is really important to me um there are some people who only manufacture really limited colors and that's a struggle but i really have committed to trying to sell everything we possibly can so like there's one company in japan that makes something called a masho that only comes in like fluorescent peach color but we sell it because it's a really good shape and not everybody cares so much um so some people would put a packer just in a jock strap sometimes people just put them just in their underwear although we've evolved enough that that's not the best I- people don't do that as much anymore because that is not the best idea because take off your underpants your packer falls out so this is a really simple strap that's made by a company that's been around for years that's um actually a leather company they focus mostly on BDSM gear, but they also um, do a lot of trans stuff. Um, And so this is just basically, it's called a packing strap, and you put the packer in here, it's nice and secure. Um, You wear it under your underpants, 
we usually recommend wearing it either under your underpants or you could wear them in between. It's really a good idea for the most part to not have your packer right up against your body for the most of the time. It's sweaty, you, your bits can't breathe. Some of the packers that are made out of cheaper porous materials are not something you want up against any part of your body for a long period of time. You just could have a reaction um, or we don't know exactly what they're made out of. So a strap like this works really well in anybody in any clothes. Um, then we also have, there's a company called Rodeo that started making dildo harnesses. Um, I don't know when. That'd actually be really interesting to talk to. And they, um, I think like me, kind of got into this business on one angle and were realizing that a lot of their clients were trans guys. And so they started making underwear that is not meant for using with a dildo or any sort of penetrative stuff, but basically just has a pocket in it so that you can um, hold your pecker extraordinarily securely. Um, and make sure it's not sideways. It's easier when it's on someone's body. Um, and have your pecker in your underwear so you have that bulge. So for a lot of people, you know, it's about what they feel like in their body. Um, I have the stuff under my clothes. Nobody knows. Nobody can tell. Um, maybe I'm not presenting as masculine as some people. Maybe I'm presenting really masculine and I'm using guys' bathrooms and I'm using um, men-only spaces. And so having, so there's different degrees of which people need this stuff to look realistic. So um, for some people who want to uh, stand and pee, um, all they need to do is to be about something to move the urine away from their body so they can use something like this. They're not they're not um, doing it in public. They're doing it either in their home or in stalls or something like that. So um, devices that can help someone to stand up and pee um, can be great. Uh, I mean, can be great. Of course they can be great. But they can be totally non-realistic. Or if somebody is in a situation where they need to be passing as much as possible, um, they now make more realistic ones so that, assuming nobody's, you know, get really up in your business you can wear these um there's straps that people make to wear stps and so these kind of function then as packers as well as uh urinary devices so you kind of get um two in one with this which for a lot of people is great because then you only have one thing you have to worry about and then this fits under your clothes you can kind of angle it where you want it whip it out when you need to go to the bathroom um and this is, STPs are kind of what everybody, like, packers are great, but if, if everyone made, if everyone could pee through every packer, everyone's problems would be solved and life would be so much easier for people. But yeah, so that's the majority of the, the types of things that we sell for stand to pee. Yes. That is another thing that I didn't realize that I would be crying in the shower over because that's, you know, it's, it's so vitally important for so many people. And the technology and the industry just isn't where people want it to be. And especially when you um, uh, add in affordability and people are very mad at me sometimes because things don't exist <laughs> that they want to exist. So for packers, we have packers that start at $12 and go up to um, about 60, I think. There's um, a really nice silicone one. I think this is their most expensive one at 60. So a lot of the non-silicone ones, the ones that are made of a porous material, are between 12 and $20. And then um, it's about 40 to 60 for a silicone one, which can seem like a lot. But if it's something that you're wearing every day, it's like a good pair of glasses, you know, like if you're wearing it every day and it becomes an important part of your identity, um, it's sometimes worth the investment to get something that's going to last and it's not going to degrade or change color or off gas or something like that. And then for straps, um, like we have a really simple strap that's like $15 and then the underwear is usually like um, $20 to $30, to kind of depending on how many features it has. Oh, sure. Well, I mean, I mean, I would love to have um, a wider variety of binders. I would love to have binders that were cute. I would love to have binders that fit bodies better, um, that we could make some money off of, in all honesty. Um, stand to pee devices, we have a great selection, but I think that um, people would love ones that, you know, there could be more variety of sizes. But I think that what we have really functions really well. Um, but besides that, I feel like, um, you know, there's always something that somebody wants that doesn't exist that 
isn't going to exist. You know, like there's always the unicorn. Um, and so we try to be, we try to listen to those. We hear about these things all the time. We try to listen to them. We try to help people troubleshoot. Um, and we try to help, you know, we give feedback to manufacturers, but a lot of time the feedback is what I know, like sort of impossible. People want what would be the most amazing thing in the world is a packer that was limp that could magically harden and then you could pee through like that is what everybody wants and that's just not a thing that's possible right now um there are um items i guess i don't have one that are that are stps that have holes in them that you could put a rod in them so they could have an erection and you can pee through them. So, so this is pretty as much as good as you get, but you're taking rods out, you're moving things around. Um, but yeah, I don't know. There's nothing else really. Like I feel like this is, this is a good variety of things, even though it's never enough. Totally essential. And for, you know, I mean, you know, we've talked to people who are like, I can't leave the house until I get this. And I'm like, okay, well, sorry. It's the mail's just gonna take a couple days. But, um, you know, who, who it is just such an important part of folks. And, and the, I mean, the best part is hearing from folks who are kind enough to share with us that after they've gotten something, that how embodied they feel, how, um, how, transformed they feel in a sense and how for the first time they finally feel like ah, you know this is this is who I am this is so right um and you know that's that makes up for all the people who challenge us and who don't understand how the postal system works or who you know think that they coming at us mean is the way to go um I don't know, there's something about it. Oh, you know what would be an ma amazing magical thing? You know how they have like lipstick or foundation that like changes color depending on something about you? I don't know, I see advertisements for lipstick that changes colors, but if there's some way that um, that dildo, that um, packers could change color based on the person, <laughs> that would be, I mean, because there's a lot of struggle with people because these are, none of these are human colors. Um, they're very close to human colors and I think that's really hard for a lot of people and it's hard for people who make them because it's skin is a living thing it's really hard to make something that's not skin look like it's alive but again I think people have to realize how little people are looking at the color of that and just the shape so I think the customer base for FTM Essentials um, is, is, is more varied than it might sound from its very whatever mundane name um we definitely i mean it's, it's a it's a web most of our business is from the web so we don't necessarily know everything about our clients but they tend to be on the younger end of the spectrum um from what i can tell um and mo a larger portion of them identify as men um they're either using masculine names or they're um yeah, so they're definitely people who folks who identify as men are men. But that said, it's interesting to see in the store where we actually get to interact with people, how many of the people who are accessing this stuff are also folks who don't look traditionally masculine or who are maybe experimenting with gender or who maybe um, you would look at and identify as one gender, but they're embodying another gender and it just doesn't necessarily read for you in the same way. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that, I, again, this line, I think a couple of years ago, the people who bought this stuff were the people who would walk in the store and look like men. And now you're seeing more of a variety of the way that people are presenting and trying very hard to make this not at all problematic when we're talking about it. but. Um, just a wider variety of our perceived gender expressions. Um, but I do think that for the most part, and in why I started FTM Essentials and even trans kids, is that we are seeing this as being definitely, for the most part, I don't know what age is younger, but younger than me. Um, and when I go, like when I go to conferences and I vend, um, a lot of the folks who are older are... Um, they're interested, but a lot of them are either like over it 
they're they're very keen to tell me that they're like, ugh, I did that, you know, ten years ago, and I gave up because it's not worth it. Like they don't, I don't pack anymore. I don't find, you know, like, which is interesting. Um, or they're kind of um, just completely not interested, like that. And I don't know if it's generational or if it's that there was. I, have, I feel like I have no right to say any of this, but anyway, but. Anecdotally, what I have gleaned from people who I've spoken to is that there are sometimes older folks who have had, who are are guys who've had a masculine or transmasculine identity for years and years and years, and when they came out or out or started living that way or whatever, didn't have access to such gear, and so they've made these lives without it, and so their approach to it is kind of sometimes very different. Sometimes it's like, oh my God, this is amazing, I can't believe they have this now, I wish they had this 30 years ago, or like... I don't need that. You know, like I've lived this long. This is who I am. My identity is really set. I don't need to pack my pants. So it's kind of, I don't know. It's interesting. It's almost the minute I think I have an idea of who my customer is or who these people are, that it is totally then changes again. So one thing I've learned is to never think you know what you're doing. <laughs> um, definitely, uh, we are not uh, the kind of business people just happen upon. <laughs> um, first of all, the store front is very branded early to bed. There's actually no mention of FTM Essentials or trans kids in the window of early to bed, which completely at this very moment, I'm having an idea. I'm like, oh, we should have that somewhere. Um, although we shouldn't say anything about kids. But uh, so, yeah, how, so... And, and so much of our clients come from online, and I wish I had a better idea of how they find us. Um, I think a lot of them come from Google. We've been, again, like, it's interesting. It, we haven't been doing this for that long, but we've been doing it for longer than a lot of other places. So our SEO is pretty good, all that, you know, boring uh, internet stuff. Um, so people come for us from there. Um, and we do, we vend at this conference every year, so we try to reach out to people. We have one very influential blogger who's a trans guy blogger who reviews stuff for us, although he does, he drives people to early to bed, so it's actually not people driving people to FTM Essentials, so. Yeah, I don't know, if I knew, I would try to um, capitalize on that. Um, but I'm just very grateful that people do find us. Um, I think there's a significant amount of word of mouth in this industry. Um, people tell people. We do a ton of outreach, um, mostly as early to bed, but also I do outreach as FTM Essentials. So we go to groups um, of trans guys who have like social groups. I've gone to like a summer camp for queer youth um, to give a sort of show and tell about all this stuff. Um, so we try to make information about this stuff as accessible as possible. Um, we try to advertise our um, free binder program to people because uh, I'm really good at advertising things that are cost me money rather than make me money. Um, it's a good business when I am. But yeah, so I don't know. I would, I, I, it's always on my list of things to do is to try and figure out how people find it. Well, I think what's most successful to me about FTM Essentials is I feel like we and I cannot credit myself, I think I don't know, this just sort of happened, that we've been able to really reach um, a wide, a wide birth of people that we, I mean, what to me seems like a really large percentage of FTM Essential Orders are going overseas. So we are reaching people in, you know, all these other countries, um, which has its own perils, but it also is, A lot of times, you know, we hear from people and it's like, there's nothing like this in my entire country, you know, something like that. Um, We, I look at um, the orders that we get and how many of them are coming from places I've never heard of, you know, that, that there's small towns that we're able to help people who are, um, you know, isolated from their communities. We, you know, in all of the FTM Essentials orders, we include a resource guide for people, for places they can connect and, you know, get information because we understand that, you know, with the internet, the internet's great, you know, and you can get a lot of information and obviously they found us on the internet, but we really think it's important to make sure people know that there's, you know, a lot of people out there who are are there for them and to help them. Um, This is a population of people who can really struggle with, 
depression and feeling lots of things and their parents can be horrible and stuff like that. Um, so I think what makes me feel really good about this is that we're selling stuff. No, I mean, there's no, I'm not a philanthropist or whatever. Like this is a, this is a business. I am, I mean, I do do my best, but, um, you know, this is a business that makes money. We need to make money in order to survive. Um, I think sometimes people don't get that. I mean, we get people every single day who just ask us if we can send them free stuff and it's heartbreaking to be like, we can't, I mean, we couldn't run a business if we did. Um, but that, um, we are able to kind of touch people who are in a lot of cases by themselves and help them. I mean, it's, one of the most rewarding retail kind of things I could imagine. I mean, I get a similar feeling from early to bed knowing that we're helping people have orgasms and that's, you know, a wonderful thing. Um, but this almost feels, you know, just as if not more so crucial as far as what uh, satisfaction or kind of, uh, I don't know, goodness people get from what we're selling. And that we're able to do it and it works without having to be a huge struggle on our end. Well, when I got into this industry, when I got into early to bed, this FTM Essentials was nowhere in my mind. I mean, this was nothing that I thought would happen. Um, I got into this industry to sell vibrators and dildos and um, this was an obvious involvement in a lot of ways. Um, even though not everybody who has a sex story story evolves in this way. Um, so I think that this whole existence has surprised me. The fact that we get almost as many orders on FTM Essentials as we do on Early to Bed, that like number of boxes that leave the store each day are kind of, they end up being pretty even, which I think is pretty interesting to me um and surprising um and i'm also i have to say one thing that has pleasantly surprised me is that i'm always concerned about getting pushback for the fact that i'm a cisgendered woman who's doing this um and there's been very little of that at all if at all um especially like when we go to a conference and i'm talking to people face to face and there's you know i don't look like someone who's identifying as a masculine person. Um, I'm honest about my relationship to these objects. Um, and, you know, I sort of expect there to be more criticism of that. Um, and I'm willing to take that. Um, but I'm really excited <laughs> that uh, that hasn't become an issue because um, I'm just here doing this because I'm responding to people's needs. This wasn't some great plan I had to like make a million dollars off of a community, um, which I haven't. Um, so that I think is, I hope that continues. I hope that I'm continue, or that I'm able to continue to do this and be honest about who I am um, and my motivations and have them met and been and be received positively within the community that people understand that I'm just doing this because they don't know what else to do. <laughs> and there should be. I mean, right. like, I think that a lot right. of it, a lot right. of it is valid. Right. Like, when I opened the sex toy store, what was really important to me was that I was going to be this person who was talking to other people like me. It was new for there to be a woman owning a sex toy store talking to women about sex toys. I'll talk to anybody about sex toys, but my heart and my, um, why I did it was to have that kind of familial relationship. And so this is kind of a totally different thing in the sense that, you know, um, this, this isn't me, uh, who I am. Uh, and so I worry about that. Um, but, and that's why almost why trans kids seems more comfortable because it's about me as a parent of a trans kid kind of talking to other parents of trans kids. Um, and I feel very comfortable in that role. I feel comfortable in this role in the sense that I know, I mean, I, regardless of my identity from my years of doing this, I know stuff. I have this knowledge. I understand these things. I know how they're used, you know? So I think that at least I have 
um, something to offer people. Um, but yeah, it is a, it's, it's something that I try to be hyper aware of, you know, I don't want anyone to ever think that I, my intentions are misguided or that I'm, you know, I shouldn't be doing this, but. Well, I think when you're, I know you're talking to a lot of manufacturers too, right? Mostly manufacturers. And I think about like, um, the woman or the person does rebirth garments. Um, like that's somebody who's making stuff for themselves. Like they're very involved in the presentation of it. I think some of those, um, trans, the masculine clothing companies are people who wanted to have those things for themselves. And so they're making them to wear them, which is like, and I think with the makers, like I definitely know for a fact, you know, the people who are making a lot of this stuff, especially the smaller stuff, are people who wanted these things to exist for them. Um, and so they made them. But so I'm just kind of this like conduit of getting it out there. And if someone wants to come along and do it better, you know, just the field is wide open, knock yourself out. But oh, of course, I'm always terrible with stories after the fact. Um, but so the best, it's, <laughs> I spend so much of my life behind the computer doing things that don't involve interacting with people anymore, which is both good and bad. So when we go to this conference every year in Philly, I sit at the table for three days and talk to people, which is exhausting, but it's also the most chance I have to get feedback from people. And um, it's been really interesting to see, it's been really interesting to see how the trans kid stuff has been perceived because there's so much confusion about why we would have <laughs> penises that small. And the first thing people, and the first thing people who, you know, are people who I'm, <clears throat> who are also looking at, you know, trans gear for themselves, they see this tiny penis, and the first thing they think of is that it's a keychain. I swear to God, nine times out of 10, people see a tiny penis and think it's a keychain. I'm like, there's no ring on it. I mean, come on. And they're, and as soon as I say, no, it's for little kids, everyone goes, oh my God, that's so amazing. Um, for the most part, one person called us a pervert, but whatever. Um, or perverts could use them. I was like, yeah, perverts can use anything they want. Okay. So that like, and, and then, so, oh my God, that's so amazing. Oh my God. I wish that was something when I was six years old or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so that is like, that's the thing about trans kids is interesting is there's like, there's not a lot of action as far as sales and stuff like that, which is fine. But the, um, good feel, like, I feel like it's just my, like, feel good about myself thing. People just really give me so much positive feedback about its existence and, um, the fact that we're trying to do that. So that's really good. Um, when it comes more to FTM essential stuff, I mean, everybody has, there's a lot of really positive feedback about, um, things, but there's the thing that's so interesting about, and it's like sex toys, but like about the stuff, like I can have this STP that 90% of the people love that I have sold it to like a 12 year old who's gone and used it and then come back and told me how great it was like super easy. And then I have, you know, three people who walk up and tell me it's the worst thing they've ever spent. They can't believe they bought that. And of course my heart is broken and I'm sorry, but I'm not taking it back. But, um, it's such a, everything is so personal. Everything is so about your physiology, about your comfort, about how you use it. And I feel like it is a really, this whole industry is like this, but it, everything really comes down to the individual. And so we are really careful. Like if we get, you know, excessive negative feedback about something like this does not work, we'll definitely look at, you know, do we need to sell this? Should we warn people about this? Um, we've carried products that we've been like, we think, and, and we will only do this for stuff for trans guys because there's so much more limited things, but we'll, you know, out there. So we'll say that we think this sucks. We hate with this material. You should know about this material. Here's the problems with this material, you know, but whatever. And we'll still sell a ton of them because people are desperate for things that fit what they need or want. Um, I don't know if that was really a question, but, um, yeah, we get, it's uh, the feedback is never consistent enough. You know, it's always like, I love this. I hate this. I love this. I hate this. This makes me feel great. This made me feel terrible. Um, so it's a little hard, but overall, um, we get a lot of people who more than anything, thank us for existing, which, um, 
is great because <laughs> that's easy to do. But um, that makes me feel really good. And talking to parents, like th- sometimes we'll have parents are always what pull up my heartstrings because I know that there are so many kids out here who are trans and gender nonconforming young people, youth, um, who struggle so much with acceptance from their parents. And, you know, we all know what it's, it can be horrible, it can be. And when I get a parent who is ordering for their child because prom is coming up and they really need to make sure they have a binder type for prom, I'm like, oh my God, that just, you know, that's amazing. That's wonderful. Why didn't you think about this three weeks ago? But, you know, whatever. Um, prom's on the calendar usually from the beginning of the year. Um, or parents who... Um, like recently we had a young person who ordered without their parents' permission, which also happens using their parents' card. And at first we talked to the parents and they were like, what is this? What did you send my kid? You know, and we talked to them and explained what it was and they're like, oh, okay. Well, you know what? Is there a better one than the one that you sent us? Cause maybe we should upgrade and they end up upgrading. You know, you're just like, oh my God, we have this opportunity to explain something to a parent who came at us upset and then that parent turned around and supported their young person which is just I don't know I don't know if that's really feedback but that's um that's the kind of thing that you know makes everything sort of worthwhile when you have people who are um were somehow the conduit to them supporting their young person or their kid well for imagery, actually, I would say there's some imagery that we just use that the manufacturers have provided us, and there's some imagery that we use that's mine. Um, we, for the most part, have everything not attached to a body. So we use images of binders from the manufacturer, um, which is great. Um, so a lot of we do use some imagery from manufacturers for binders we use the imagery from the manufacturer and it's been nice they've shifted I think the people who make the binders that we sell um, Underworks they started out making like medical like hernia gear and stuff like that and then people started using their and uh, binders for cisgendered men who maybe had more chest than they wanted um, and they finally like figured out who was actually buying their stuff and now they provide us with images of people who look like they were trans guys who look like they're actually using it for the purpose of selling it so I use their images because I feel very comfortable with them um and then for the most part I just try to take pictures that look good that show what's going on with the object I take a picture of everything in my own hand because um I'm a very cheap model um but also because I feel like uh well, one, it's really easy for me to take a picture in my own hand, but also then I feel like it, there's a consistency of scale, even though no one knows what my hand size is, and it's a pretty average hand size, but that um, if I have the same, if I have two different sizes of packers in the same hand, it hopefully gives them some perspective, even though I can put lots of the dimensions and people still are like, what? It's too small or too big. But um, so I just try, especially with FTM Essentials, to make it as explicit as possible but also look really good I think one of the things that um, I noticed with a lot of other websites especially with this stuff is photography is not really um, valued <laughs> maybe as much as I value it and I'm just taking stuff you know I'm taking pictures with my iPhone like it's I'm not like you know, some photographer or anything like that but it's not that hard to get a picture that's clear um, I struggle with the skin tones um, because it's really hard to get those to look exactly right um, and get the color balance right and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, for me, it was really important to just have consistency and to have things look good. Like, it's really easy to make a website look decent and it's super easy to make a website, it's just as easy to make a website look terrible and I don't understand why people can't go with that. It's really not that hard. Um, but I, I am very visually attuned, especially when it comes to online shopping. Like, I feel like the first thing that's going to make me trust a store is going to be the quality of their images and how, if they, if they had, how much they look different. Like, if I see a store that all they're doing is 
using the same images that the manufacturer, the maker has provided. I'm concerned that the person who was running that store has ever touched that object, has ever handled that object, who knows what that object actually looks like, or if they're just cutting and pasting from somebody else, which is also why I write something about everything. And even if I'm copying and pasting a lot of information from the maker, which I try to make obvious I'm copying and pasting, maybe I don't do a good job of that, but I try to have my spin on it too, so that they know, so that people trust that somebody who's writing about this, who's selling this, um, knows more than just what they've been told by the person who made it. It's exhausting, but. <laughs> sure. Um, so when I started my business, Early to Bad, in 2001, Kickstarter was just a gleam in somebody's eye. Um, and actually, for the sex toy industry, getting funding from uh, traditional methods is actually extremely hard. Um, the sex toy industry is still seen as high risk. Um, we get screwed on insurance rates and credit card rates, and banks will just drop us. It's kind of a nightmare. So. I funded early to bed with credit cards, the traditional way. Um, when I had my last office job and a regular salary, I applied for a lot of credit cards. Hey, I hung on to them and bought, you know, all my opening, pretty much everything. My mom and her husband had given me some money. A friend had loaned me a little bit of money. Um, but for the most part, it was credit card funded. Um, and then, you know, like a lot of small businesses, many scary lean years. Um, but FTM Essentials kind of came around and was split off at a time when actually Early to Bed was doing really poorly. Um, and so I don't know if I consciously thought of that as a way to just diversify, diversify my revenue stream. That sounds so wrong and yet businessy, um, but maybe not even right. Um, so it was all kind of coming from the same money. So basically the stock that I buy for FTM Essentials the same, you know, buy for the store as well. Um, so funding, um, for the most part, when I've needed funding, it's been credit cards and my mom who has, uh, bailed me out twice since 2001. I'm very lucky she married up when my dad died. Um, but that has all been paid off and now we are for the most part completely self-sufficient and almost debt free, which is huge because I was really 2012 was a really 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 bad scary year so um, I do think that I can credit also FTM Essentials and the um, the new customers it has brought in with helping it helps keep early to bed here like I couldn't I, I don't know that I could just have this storefront and survive if it was any you know except for me I just worked here alone every day um, but it has really helped um, keep early to bed functioning and keep everybody kind of functioning. So, no, I think at this point, um, at this, at this point, my focus is so split between kind of everything that I'm doing that I don't have this like luxury of like trying to find inspiration. And so, um, what I'm really driven by is what people are asking for and for the most part, what comes out. Um, what makers are making and you know there is very few exceptions like if it's available we'll probably carry it because even if it's not the best thing it's something else to have and when these offerings are still so small um, we kind of try to get everything that we can um, that people will let us sell uh, so yeah I, it was it's a great idea I think like, oh I just go through Instagram and I see what the kids are wearing and then I think what you know and I think it's different as a retailer because I'm not creating anything in the same sense, and so I just have to be kind of responsive to what's available and to what people are looking for. So I will sometimes um, get sort of feedback from people who follow us on social media. Like I was very uh, not sold necessarily on the idea that people would want like these sort of fancy underpants, and I was like, nobody wants those. And then I posted on social media, and I was like, we totally want those. And so I picked it up, not so much as I like anyone ever asked for them, or I thought they, I thought they were cute, but then I had not the, the market for them. So I do kind of use uh, sometimes feedback that we get from um, our followers on social media, I think more than anything. It is important, and it should be something I focus on more, but it definitely, I think, um, you know, we try to, to do what we can but um it definitely especially 
the age group that we're dealing with, I think that social media is way more important than it is for, um, you know, other age groups. 